Hi, everyone. Uh, this is David Roos. I think we'll get started with just a, a minute or two of, of introductions while we're still waiting for some other people to, to get on. Um, let me just tell you uh, a word or two about what, uh, uh, what the goal of these webinars are. Um, you know, obviously, the Isomer program has been running for some time now. Uh, the, the first round of Isomers is completed, the second one still still getting underway. And as many of the people on the call know, the PlasmoDB group, part of the, uh, the UPathDB Bioinformatics Resource Center that also supports the ClinepiDB project that you'll hear more about in future, um, has, has been tasked with working with data managers and projects to try to ensure that, that uh, um, data can be most effectively uh, understood and used not just by the individuals who have generated it, by the, but by the broader community. And in thinking about the kinds of things that might be most effective, uh, the program officers, uh, uh, Mala Rao and Deirdre Joy, uh, asked whether it might be worth exploring the use of webinars as a cost-effective means to discuss topics of, 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 of general interest to various uh, members of the, uh, of the isomers and in a level of depth that is a, a, with a potentially broader audience than can possibly be devoted during, say, the, the annual isomer meetings. And so um, uh, uh, Sheena Tomko, who many of you have met and works with the ClinepiDB uh, project, and, uh, and, and Isabella uh, uh, rodriguez Barake had uh, agreed to help um, coordinate a, a list of potential webinars that we will cast on an irregular basis over the over the coming months, uh, Isabel and her and her uh, uh, colleague um, uh, Brian Greenhouse had agreed to talk about uh, seroepidemiology to kick this off in the first of our presentations today. Uh, we have also planned to run a a uh, a, a uh, demonstration and discussion presentation about the ClinepiDB platform for interrogating and mining clinical and epidemiological data sets. And there's a long list of potential topics that we could consider exploring in future, depending on the interest of people on this call and members of other, um, uh, of, of other isomers. So you'll hear more about that as, as we move along. But one of the things that you should be thinking about today is what other topics you might be interested in hearing about in, in future uh, webinars. So I'll, I'll pass the mic back to uh, Sheena in just a moment for some, in, for some uh, uh, advice on how to participate in today's webinar. But I should also maybe just ask whether any of the NIH program staff uh, on, the, on the call had any additional comments that they wanted to make. Uh, I know, see that you are on, uh, uh, Mala, are you? Um, so oh. you can you can comment in one of two ways. You can raise your hand, which is a there's a small icon off to the left side of the GoToWebinar panel, and if you do that, we can allow you to speak, or you can type a question directly into the large question box. And I can unmute Mala as well in case. Yeah. Mala, you should be able to speak now. Okay. Okay. Thanks, David. That's that's very useful. Uh, welcome to all to this first webinar. As David said, uh, why don't you guys uh, at the end of the webinar uh, put together your thoughts and see a, f a topic area that might be of interest to you in future uh, as a subsequent webinar, which is, um, and you know, when you think about it, just don't think about it narrowly, just as it applies to a very specific narrow area for you for a research subject, but something that's more broad, well, which will be of interest to all the isomers uh, in general. So at the end of the webinar uh, today, you, uh, I think, Sheena, it'd be nice if you could send out an, uh, a little poll as to what went well, what went wrong, and some suggested topics that, uh, and then maybe circulate. First, let's discuss that at the end of the uh, webinar uh, and in the next week or so. Sounds great. Okay, thanks. Okay. I, you could mute me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay, Mala's muted again. So with that, I think we'll start and let Isabel and Brian talk to us about their work on seroepidemiology. So Isabel will become the presenter and then we'll get started. And recall that if you have a question raised, you can, you can click on the raise your hand or type a question in and we'll be monitoring that and, and raise uh, the questions when, when, whenever they come in. Okay. Can everyone hear me? You sound yes, great. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, we are going to be sharing uh, some work, or at least a vision of some work that we've been doing to, to of, and thinking how to use serology to characterize or improve our understanding of the epidemiology uh, of malaria. Um, um, we're both going to be presenting more or less half the presentation each, and uh, we have a couple of points or, or, or slides where we would hope people to participate, so we will see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, when we get there, the idea is that we hope to, to get your, your answers or your opinions on, on, on some topics. Uh, since this is a malaria crowd, I don't think I have to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, malaria is the most common and fatal human parasite. Um, and even though there have been important decreases over the last decades, uh, and there's good drugs and there's good interventions, uh, insecticide treated nets, um, indoor residual spreading, uh, there's still a long way to go, right? Uh, and part of the challenges in moving towards the, the elimination uh, on, on, of malaria or, or better control of malaria is that funding is flat. Uh, there doesn't seem to be more, much progress recently. Uh, and there's threats such as drug resistance or insecticide resistance. So uh, unfortunately, malaria still causes over 200 million cases a year and over half a million uh, deaths and the biggest burden is concentrated in children in sub-Saharan Africa. So, uh, as I said before, uh, there are good interventions, but unfortunately the funds are uh, limited. So really tracking malaria and knowing where and when malaria is being transmitted uh, is very important. Uh, to be able to target these interventions appropriately. Uh, and there's many fundamental questions in terms of targeting interventions appropriately, including, well, how much malaria there is, uh, where it is occurring, so the variation in, in time and space, uh, whether there are some regions or hotspots uh, or high-risk subgroups of the population that are uh, responsible for most of the transmission, uh, whether there are subgroups in the population that are more susceptible to disease. Um, and I guess more relevant for Vivax and Oval, we also need to see, to know who is carrying hypnozoites. Um, so really uh, tracking, tracking malaria or being able to measure malaria transmission appropriately is key to answer some of these questions and, and target interventions. How do we track malaria now? There is a bunch of ways. Uh, I think that a nice, at least from a theoretical point of view, uh, metric is the entomological inoculation rate, which is the number of infectious bites that a person receives per day or per year, and that can be measured by very cumbersome methods where people like uh, the man in the picture on the top uh, is doing, which actually imply sitting for long hours and waiting until the mosquito comes and, and lands on you and tries to bite you. So, so it is cumbersome, it is insensitive, and it's not widely used, even though it's in theory an nice metric. Then there's the parasite prevalence, where you go out to the population and do, let's say, a cross-sectional study and measure uh, how many people are <clears throat> infected at that point in time. Uh, and that's actually quite... Uh, widely used and, and there has been significant improvements in, in the sensitivity of the, of the tests that are used recently. Um, so that's nice, but, but the problem is that when, particularly when parasite prevalence is it, very low, uh, it is uh, 
kind of difficult to find a single person that has a parasite at that point in time. So you start needing like very large sample sizes to be sure uh, that you can rule out uh, malaria in, in a specific area. Uh, but it is also specific, uh, non-specific in high transmission because at some point essentially everyone is carrying parasites. So you cannot dis really disentangle places with high or very high transmission. You cannot use it to stratify places um, when there's high transmission. And then there's incidence of symptomatic malaria that arguably from a policy perspective is a, is a, a very important um, index, right? Um, but but it's, not, it's not easy to measure because you could measure it using health facility data, but the problem is that it's the denominator is not known. You don't know what the catchment area of that health facility is. Uh, there's inconsistency in diagnostic test use or reporting practices of different health facilities, so it's hard to compare between them. Uh, it can also be confounded by immunity because in places where there is lots of transmission, people are also more immune to disease. So you may get not as many cases. Uh, so really, health facility surveillance is, is only useful for very low transmission settings. Uh, where everyone is essentially non-immune. Uh, and then you also have cohort studies where you actually can very accurately measure incidence if you follow a cohort of people and, and track them and call them, let's say, every week and make sure to capture uh, their incident malaria infections, but also their incident uh, asymptomatic infections. That's a good way to do it, but it's, of course, extremely expensive. So there's only a bunch of those in the whole world, so it cannot really be used to target interventions uh, on a global scale. Um, and really uh, to emphasize why parasite prevalence, while good, is not ideal, um, let's imagine you have like this population that, that we've, we've uh, painted here on the figure. Um, and let's imagine that the person in red is currently infected, right? But the other people uh, shown in the lines have experienced infection. So this person on the top experienced an infection almost a year ago, and these other people experienced infections more recently, uh, but are not currently infection, infected, right? So if we were to sample this population, all of these individuals, and test them for parasites, we would only find one of them positive at the time, right? Uh, and that would be useful, right? But we would be missing the complete picture, which is that in fact, there was some transmission in the past in this population. Um, and that's where we think that antibodies could help, right? Uh, because immune responses are longer lasting. Uh, you can find them well after uh, the parasite is, is found in the body, right? So if we were to measure like a good antibody response, a validated antibody response in this same population, uh, hopefully it would tell us as well that these other persons in green were infected, let's say, in the last year. Um, and really this idea that antibodies and immune responses can be used uh, to track, sorry, this idea that antibody responses can be used to track uh, infections uh, <clears throat> is not new. Antibody responses have been used since the 60s uh, to, me to measure exposure to malaria, but, but also, I mean, for, for many other infectious diseases. Um, but mostly what has been used to, to, for malaria are uh, some specific purified recombinants that are used uh, via ELISA. Um, and it's just a few epitopes that have been, uh, or a few recombinants uh, that have been optimized, or many times people also use like extract of the full malaria parasite to test for, for antibodies. Um, and these can, can be really informative of, of any exposure in the past, right? So uh, let's say, um, we're looking for, again, at these four individuals that all have been infected in the last 10 years, but at different moments in these last 10 years, and they would all be equally po positive uh, in these markers that are markers of, of prior or historical uh, immunity. Uh, and the nice thing of this kind of marker is that if you conduct an age-stratified serological survey, and here in this figure I'm showing uh, 
uh, an age 35, like the results of an age 35 serological survey where I'm plotting on the x axis the age and on the y axis the proportion that are positive. When you are in an endemic setting, so in a place where there is continuous transmission of any pathogen, you expect this kind of nice relationship between age and positivity, right? Um, older people are more seropositive, and that's simply because they have been exposed for for a longer period of time. So, so really, the only thing that di differentiates this person that is age 20, or the main thing that differentiates this person that is 20, or this group of people that are 60% seropositive, let's say. Uh, as compared to these 10 year olds that are more like 35% sure positive is those extra 10 years of life, right? So if you feed a model to this kind of data, uh, and these are called uh, catalytic models, uh, and you calculate the seroconversion rate, uh, you, get, you can measure uh, the force of infection or the transmission intensity in a population. Um, and this has been used for many diseases here. I'm, I'm, I have an example from actually dengue transmission uh, based on uh, cross-sectional surveys conducted in different cities. Uh, and you see different seroconversion patterns, right? So you have places like Morelos in Mexico where people seroconvert slowly, which is a strong signal of uh, lower transmission as compared to other places like Chennai in India or, or Recife in Brazil where people circumvert much faster, which indicates uh, that there's much higher transmission. And the same has been done for malaria. So this is, for example, some sur survey, it's on serological markers in, from three settings in Uganda that have different levels of transmission. And you can see that in Walakuba, which is the lower transmission area, uh, Walakuba, that is the lower transmission area, uh, seroconversion is occurring slower than in Nagongera, which is the higher transmission area that before IRS was implemented had EIRs, entomological inoculation rates of over 300. And in the figure on the right is just to reinforce that these seroconversion rates are potentially better metrics than, let's say, parasite prevalences. Uh, and here we are, the, the plot on the right is uh, well, showing two set of points. The orange set of points uh, shows the correlation between EIR and parasite prevalence for a wide range of settings. And the gray triangles show the correlation between, again, EIR, but also seroconversion rates calculated for these settings. And, and what you can see is that actually the fit of the seroconversion rate or how it correlates to EIR is better, right? So, so it seems to be uh, capturing transmission better. Uh, now, we've talked about, yeah, calculating zero conversion rates with these long list markers. Can, can you think of some limitations uh, of using this type of marker? Anyone want to participate? You can participate by raising your hand or typing in the questions box, and we'll let Isabel know. I somehow lost the... So there's one question um, or one comment from Anne um, saying not all markers are relevant in all populations. Yeah, that's a good one. Any other ideas? Okay. So I think that that's an important one. All markers uh, are not good in all populations and, and uh, Let's, let's forget about that for a second. Let's just focus on the idea that these are long-lived markers, right? Uh, I think the main limitations of long-lived markers in general are that they're good to estimate average. Than, so for example, if you go out and conduct a cross-sectional survey, right? Uh, they're very good to estimate an average transmission rate, right? Uh, but they are less good to estimate changes in transmission from a single cross-section. Because if you see like these patterns increasing, uh, or, or let's say the zero conversion rate seems to be changing at some point on the curve, uh, 
that could be truly because transmission change, but there could, it could also be because there is some age-dependent risk, right? So particularly in, in, if you're dealing with a pathogen where risk is very age-dependent, it becomes very hard to tease out changes in time versus just this age uh, dependence. Um, but also, if, if, if you think that we're dealing with long-lived antibodies, uh, it really takes time to build in a population, and in the same way, it takes time to wane in a population, right? So if you are in a place where transmission has changed, has been changing either gradually or dramatically, uh, there, it, it will take some time before this change in transmission actually sets a footprint in the immune responses of the population. Uh, so these are two things to keep in mind and, and, and as, as limitations of using long lived markers to characterize epidemiology or, or transmission intensity. Still, uh, it is probably more efficient to use these kind of markers than infection prevalence. Um, but if you're going to use them, you still need to go out and, and sample, let's say, an age stratified uh, or obtain an age stratified sample of the population. So uh, now Brian is going to continue for a bit. Okay, great. Thanks, Isabel. Um, so Isabel's explained how antibodies can be useful and how long-lived antibodies in particular can be used, but also some of their limitations. And the idea is that if we can get more information from each individual person, which is really the most expensive part of any work that we're doing, if we're going out, especially if we're going out and doing an active survey, um, then we'll have much more cost savings or alternatively uh, be able to get more information from the same amount of money. So how do we get more information from antibodies? Uh, the, you know, the good news and the bad news for everyone that does malaria work knows that you know, we have a lot of different proteins to consider when we're looking at antibody responses or immune responses in general. Um, so there's about 5,000 proteins. They have varying immunogenicity. Some of them are not immunogenic at all. Some of them are extremely immunogenic. Uh, and when we're trying to tease things out between them, it can be challenging. But the good news is when we're looking at a biomarker, we want some variability. We want different biomarkers that are going to tell us different things. And the idea would be that if we can combine data from antibodies with different kinetics, different strengths of antibody responses over different periods of time, we could reconstruct more of a detailed history of exposure. So in this plot, this is the same plot from before. You can see there's three individuals that have been exposed in the past. They all look green. They, they look the same. They, both, they all have positive antibody responses. We don't know really which one of them has, if any, have been exposed recently and which ones have just been exposed historically but are in an area now say, that they are absolutely malaria transmission. Next slide. But if we added just a second antibody here, one in blue with a shorter a shorter uh, kinetic, we could see now that the combination of the blue and the green responses are different and potentially allows us to reconstruct a little bit more of the history. So the person at the top, uh, who's in blue, we could tell based on the high green response and low blue response that they have been exposed to malaria in the past, but not recently. Um, whereas the person in orange, they've got a low blue response. So some they've been exposed sometime in the recent past, but not very recently. And the person who is highlighted in green has been exposed somewhat recently, you know, perhaps within the last few months, because both of their responses are, are high. And, the, and we can still distinguish all three of these from the person who's never been exposed. So this is just a Kind of toy example, but you can see already just by drawing uh, curves for two different antibodies, you can get a lot more information per person. And then, of course, by extension, you can get a lot more information for a population by averaging your information across people. Next slide. So we um, have done a proof of concept of this uh, kind of approach where we I try to identify the best biomarkers of recent exposure. Uh, and then apply them to a population using our first isomer cohorts um, uh, in a paper that, that Danica published a few years back. And we did this by looking at different timelines of individuals. So on the top left, you can see each row of, of circles there is an individual's infection history over a period of time, uh, over a period of five years in this case. And you can see every time that they're they have malaria or they had asymptomatic parasitemia. And what this means is that we can take any point where we have a serum sample or plasma sample and go back in time and estimate what their recent exposure has been. We then applied uh, a, a custom protein microarray from Phil Felger's lab to get 
uh, antibody responses for about 800 different antigens. And then by using a variety of analytical techniques, we were able to identify the most informative markers of recent exposure. What the two plots on the right are showing are essentially a summary of the results. The x-axis shows how many different antibodies were included in that particular uh, in that particular run. And the y-axis is showing the cross-validated R-squared, which is essentially just a matter of how well we're able to predict the outcome of interest. In this case, we looked at the days since last person's infection and also their incidence of malaria in the last year. And the, the good news, I think, is that we can get relatively accurate information about um, the things that we care about, for instance, days since last infection, with just a handful of antibody markers. So even though we looked at 800 or so, you, if you pick the top five or six, you can get essentially all the information that you need, at least with this particular data set. Um, the other thing that's, that's of interest is that if you do a, a selection for the markers that are the most informative, it's much more efficient than just randomly assaying a bunch of markers that happen to be immunogenic. So what we did here is we, we picked uh, markers in the circles, the filled circles are when we picked the markers and we used the continuous value, essentially a, a proxy of the titer, um, where the hollow sock circles are the same selection process, but we just said yes or no, you have, a, you have an antibody response to antibody X or Y. Uh, the squares indicate random. So, you know, with again, with this custom microarray where we, from the get-go, identified markers that we thought would potentially be uh, informative. The more you add, the better you do, um, but it's much more efficient to pick a handful of informative ones than, you know, dozens of, of random ones. And this was true uh, for both different outcomes that we looked at. Um, now, noted this was only in two different cohorts in Uganda. There was a range of transmission intensities and ages, but it was still relatively narrow. Uh, but we felt it was a good proof of concept, not something that's going to give us sort of the answer that we can use across the whole world of, of malaria epidemiology that we want to measure, but certainly um, uh, a validation of the approach. Next slide. This is just a couple more results from that same study. Um, as Isabel said, you know, parasite prevalence is, is good and we have it for essentially the whole planet, but we can do better than that. And on the left, we're showing basically when you take subsamples of different communities and you take those same individuals uh, data for whether or not they had parasites in their blood or what their values were for six different antibodies that were selected, you get a much better dynamic range and increased precision with smaller sample sizes using the antibodies versus the parasite prevalence. And again, this is these are data that you can obtain from a cross-sectional survey. So you're going out and you're spending however many thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a cross-sectional survey for you know another dollar per person or less, you could potentially get data on um, antibodies that could dramatically reduce your sample size and potentially reduce your uh, reduce your cost. On the right, it's showing something that you couldn't do with parasite prevalence as easily uh, or even long with antibodies, and that is really define within a community what the distribution of uh, transmission is. So uh, using the household level entomologic data in our prism, our isomer cohort, we were able to measure mosquitoes in this one area in the southwest of Uganda. Uh, as you can see, the lower elevation areas had highest, highest amounts of mosquitoes. The red dots are all in the green areas and the blue dots are all in the brown areas. When you observe incidents with a very expensive uh, cohort design over a year, you, you recapitulate that pattern. Uh, predictions from, from six antibodies, you actually do as good, if not better, a job than doing a really expensive cohort for a year. And then, and again, this is with a single cross-sectional sample um, modeled to predict incidents from the, from the antibody measurements. Next slide. So this basically inspired us to think a little more formally about the entire process, uh, essentially generalize what we did in that one proof of concept case to an approach that we think would be valuable for identifying um, biomarkers and validating them across a wide range of settings. And we're calling this cameras, uh, combined antibodies to measure exposure recency assays. Um, there's a, a article that just came out in um, AJTMH this month uh, as, as a proof. The final version will be out next month. Isabella and I are both co-authors, uh, as well as Chris Drakely, Evo Mueller, and David Smith. And it basically outlines most of what we're talking about today and, and some things in a little bit more detail in terms of the different nuances of the approach. But essentially, the idea is to follow this, um, follow this workflow. So first, you find a, a number of different cohorts. 
ideally representing different transmission intensities, where you have a couple key pieces of information. One, you have measured infections. Um, you know when they are in relation to your bulb, and you characterize them over some period of time. You then, of course, need to measure some, some sorts of antibodies, and depending on the type of assay that you're going to use, the engines you have access to, and the throughput you want, um, you can do this in any number of ways, and we've listed three on this figure. So one is by using a bead array, such as a Luminex platform. Um, there's also solid phase protein microarrays where you can put hundreds to thousands of antigens. Um, and then we have actually recently begun developing a phase array where we can look at hundreds of thousands of epitopes at the same time um, in a different type of system. But regardless of the technology you use, the idea is the same. You want really well characterized samples, and you need to cast a broad net because a priori, I think it's going to be difficult to identify which, which antibodies are going to be the most informative until you actually get some empiric data. Um, the next step, once you generate these data, is to then, of course, identify which combinations of responses are the most informative. And we've been working on two parallel approaches. One is more of a formal kinetic modeling, where you're actually looking at the boost and decay of antibodies. And the other is just more generic uh, prediction algorithms. They both have their strengths. Um, I, probably, I probably don't have time today to get into detail, but if people have questions, we can certainly discuss either uh, briefly on the call or, or offline what the relative pros and cons of these different approaches are. But essentially, using them both together, you can identify a subset of the responses that you looked at that seem to give you the most information. Um, then the, there's going to be a required validation step where you need to characterize these responses in more detail uh, and independently validate, validate them in, in additional settings to make sure that what you're seeing is not a spurious result. Uh, this is likely would include longitudinal sampling. So if you see uh, the figure on the bottom right with all the little people, there's multiple samples per, uh, per infection time point. And the idea here would be that you can get much more precise information uh, within hosts over time to, in terms of characterizing the connects that might help you finalize your analytical approaches and also better identify which final candidates would go on your assay. And then ultimately, you would design your camera. Um, and this could be something as complicated as a, you know, a box that's a point of contact, which would be very simple for someone to operate, but very difficult to design accurately, or a more um, uh, open kind of lab-based platform, whether that's uh, a bead array or some other sort of multiplex um, array. And, and, and just as important as the technology used to measure the responses and the responses themselves will be the analytics that you apply to the data that you get so that um, it's not a complicated result. Essentially, you might have a complicated algorithm in the back end that's doing something with five or six or 10 antibody responses. But at the end of the day, you want to get out a metric that you're interested in, whether that's serial has been in the last year or how many times have they been infected in the last two years, or perhaps it's how long has it been since their last infection with some degree of certainty around that. Next slide. So there's some, there's some specific criteria that we think would be useful in terms of the studies. The first, uh, for this approach, the first is that we think cohorts are very important. And the importance of cohorts is that you really know what their past history is. Uh, ideally, you'd have long follow-up, so you can observe their history over a longer period of time. Um, we think probably at least a year. Uh, you ideally would have sensitive detection for malaria parasites, I, you know, ideally PCR or the, or the equivalent, uh, because subpatent in infections are something that we potentially want to look at, especially when transmission goes low. We know that subpatent infections are a larger proportion of the overall um, number of infections that are prevalent in a population. And ideally, you'd have some frequent surveillance for infection, whether that's some combination of active uh, or passive surveillance. It's probably not enough to just um, you know, check in with somebody you know, every six months. Uh, we probably want to have a more frequent um, identification of infections. Otherwise, we'll miss things in between. And essentially, these, all these boil down to uh, the, the importance of measuring time since last infection accurately. Ideally, you'd have also a broad range of ages and transmission intensity, and also geographic locations where you have a diversity of both the host and the parasite populations to ensure that whatever results you find are generalizable. And finally, um, plasma or serum samples both seem to work well in all these assays. Using dried blood spots is also possible. Uh, the, they're a bit noisier, but if that's all you have and you have otherwise an excellent um, cohort that is really well characterized, they are also a potential source of, of data to inform the choice of biomarkers.
Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, the the other key thing when you are designing this study to to discover which biomarkers are the most informative is sample selection, and and this is an area where where we have really spent quite a bit of time trying to decide what the best strategy is to select samples. Once you have like a the perfect cohort that Brian described, how do you go around and select samples that will be the most informative and, and give you the best answer? So uh, this figure is just an, a figure showing the experience or let's say the data from a cohort study. This is from our isomer uh, in Uganda and each row represents here an individual. So the trajectory of an individual over time since enrollment uh, in 2011, and this is up to 2015. Uh, and the different colors represent, well, different things. So whenever you see um, uh, a field circle, it means that the person was parasite positive during that visit, right? So all of the field circles are parasite positive, and then the color tells you something else. So the red field circles are instances of malaria, then a green field means that they were uh, microscopic, well, uh, patent. Uh, they have high density, density and were positive on the microscope. And then the blue field circles is when they were uh, microscopically negative, but positive by lamp in this case, which is a more sensitive method. Uh, and all the empty circles are just instances where the individuals uh, were parasite negative. So what you can see here is that in this cohort or in this set of individuals, there's lots of heterogeneity in transmission, right? Like there's, for example, this individual in the bottom row, which essentially is constantly infected and has malaria and is treated for malaria and gets infected, infected, infected again. Well, you have other individuals, particularly towards the top of the figure that are rarely infected, right? So there's a lot of heterogeneity in transmission. So I want, so if, if, if this was the cohort, uh, that you were selecting from uh, to, to test samples and discover which biomarkers and which antibody responses are more useful, how would you do it? Would you select a random sample of, of, of let's say, all of these points here? Would you do a cross-sectional survey and, and use that for your data, or would you use some other method? Uh, any ideas? And with the number of no, people no. We, with the number of people that we have on the uh, uh, call, it doesn't work to unmute everyone. But uh, Sheena is taking a look at this. If people have comments that they want to make uh, in, in response to Isabel's challenge about how you would select uh, which patients to take a look at, feel free to uh, click on the raising your hand or to just type in a comment, and we can can unmute you to share with others. Maybe maybe while people are thinking about that, let let me ask uh, uh, Isabel. Um, you did a nice job in describing, or Brian did a nice job in describing from Danica's paper, the uh, uh, the 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 cost benefit ratio that comes from looking at more or fewer antigens. Uh, how much is known about how well that translates to a different age cohort and different geographic regions? Well, I don't know if you want to respond now, Brian, or get to that idea once we talk about sample selection, because I think, I mean, we have a slide on that. So. Okay. There is one comment from someone saying a longitudinal study would be a good way to select samples. So, yeah, so it's a longitudinal study. This is a longitudinal study, but, but it's like, how would you, I mean, you have thousands of samples available, right? Like, so, so the key question is, how do you select the samples that you're gonna test, right? Um, but I mean, I think the reason I wanna emphasize this point is because uh, many people, uh, or if, if, if you don't think carefully about it, most of the people would just go and select either a random sample, right, of, of, or a cross-section, right? Like you would go out 
and say, okay, I'm going to test all of the samples from October 2013 or around 2013, or just select like a bunch of serum that you have in your free in, in your minus 80 and test uh, with known time since infection, of course, and and, and test those samples, right? Uh, but unfortunately, that's uh, not ideal. So for, for whoever is working on, on developing this kind of assays uh, to try to discover markers of exposure or even markers of immunity, uh, it is important to consider confounding that exists in data, right? And the key thing here is that people that have higher rates of infection and therefore people that have been exposed more in their life, right, because they get exposed repetitively like this person here, right? Like this, if you select a, a, a random sample from this person, the chances that they will have like a very short time since infection are very high, right? Because essentially they're positive all the time, right? Well, if you select a sample from this person on the top here, the chances are that their time since infection is gonna be very long, right? And that's concerning because that means that uh, time since infection is correlated with incidents or with cumulative exposure, and it will be correlated with antibody responses as well, right? So all of the people that have short time since infection will by default have high antibody responses, but that's because they've been infected a lot, uh, not only recently, but a lot in the past. Uh, well, people that have long time since infection will have lower anti antibody responses. Uh, that's simply because they have been infected very little in the past, right? And if you try to select markers based on that sample set, essentially, probably you're gonna get many hits that are not really good markers of recent exposure, but are simply markers of some exposure, right? Which is not really what you're trying to identify. Uh, so really you need to be very care careful around your sampling strategy to minimize this confounding. Um, and what we've been doing for, for our own studies is, uh, we, uh, with Ina uh, Gerlowina, which is one of the postdocs in the group, is worked on a, a strategy to do a stratified sampling. So we're sampling, uh, we, strat <clears throat> we stratify all of the data all, or all of the samples available from, from a cohort study uh, by cumulative incidence and time since infection. And we ensure uh, that the samples that we select uh, are balanced. And what does this mean? We, we, we ensure that we have short and long time since infection across all strata of exposure of transmission intensity. So essentially you want to make sure as much as possible that you have, let's say, from these individuals with low transmission, you're going to obtain samples close to infection, but also long after infection. And as much as possible, for people to have higher transmission, you need as well uh, short samples and long samples, right? And probably you wouldn't be able to, to include samples from very high transmission because you cannot obtain the long time since infection from them. Uh, with, one caveat, with one caveat, which is on the next slide, right? Which is... Um, go which ahead, is on that, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I guess, I guess that's, <laughs> that's here, so I won't say it. But, but uh, what caveat do you want to raise? Sorry. Oh, not nothing. It was, it's it's basically this slide. So, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, so this is another example of 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 another. So, this is our expanded uh, isomer cohort from one of the sites in Nagongera, and this is the beautiful longitudinal data that we have from this site. Uh, and what happened in this site was that there was a a uh, drastic change in transmission started in the end of 2014, and this was due to uh, IRS in, in the residual spraying. Now there's been over five rounds, but the first round was around here, and you can clearly see like the big impact that this had in the dynamics of malaria transmission in this population, right? Uh, so uh, probably in in the reason why we showed this, we're showing this figure here is because then this kind of uh, cohort becomes ideal uh, to select samples for serological surveys because here you can ultimately very easy, easily obtain short and long times from people uh, across strata uh, of, of exposure, people that have been exposed more or people that have been exposed less. 
uh, simply because there was like this uh, inter in uh, interruption or change in transmission, which was uh, pretty drastic. I don't know, Brian, you want to add something else? No, no, that was that was it. It really just allows you to get those rare samples that Isabel was saying before, where you want the long time since infection uh, in people that have had a lot of exposure in the past. And without yeah. a decrease in exposure, it's it's difficult to do that unless you've got people that are also you know moving from a high transmission area to a low transmission area. That's another way to do that. And this is just to emphasize the point of how bad the confounding can be. Here we have uh, from one of our cohorts what happens. On the left is what happens if we sample cross-sectionally, right? Just a single time point. There is a very, so on the x-axis is time in, since infection, and, and on the y-axis is like the average incidence for each of these individuals per year, right? Uh, and you see that there is like a very strong correlation between time since infection and incident infections per year, incidence of infection per year, um, if you just sample cross-sectionally, right? And, and that's problematic again, as I was saying, because we have no uh, long time since infection for people at the higher exposure strata, right? Well, if we do the stratified sampling by time since exposure and by uh, time since infection, sorry, and by incidence, uh, we get a much more balanced distribution and, uh, of time since infection across the strata of incidence, right? Uh, yeah, Brian. Sure. So, um, you know, that doesn't completely remove the confounding, but it, it makes it a whole lot better. And, and in truth, there will be some correlation in real populations between intensity of exposure and time, time of infection. But if we're, if we're really interested in changes over time, which is, I think, one of the big questions, then we want to try to reduce that as much as possible. I think another issue that people bring up rightly so with antibodies is that there's a lot of variation, right? There's a lot of biological variation. It's unclear what it means for a specific person to have a specific antibody response. Uh, I think what's what's less often considered is that it, it means something very different for some people to have parasites in their blood and other people to not as well, based on their immunity, uh, based on the level at which you're detecting, you're detecting it. Uh, and so there's always going to be some biological variation. And the question is, how do we get the most information about the transmission epidemiology that we're interested in? So on the left is, is sort of an illustration of why you know, the biological variation matters. And on the, you know, the, the plot on, all the way on the left shows the um, days since infection on the x-axis and the y-axis shows the antibody response uh, basically tighter to average, uh, tighter to a specific antibody response. On the right, it's showing that same, same graph, but the, the y-axis is now expanded to show the variation between um, all the different individuals with recent and long time since uh, time since infection uh, and not just the means. So you can see that, you know, even though the, you know, the means um, show a very nice relationship, there is still a substantial amount of biological variation with this single antibody. So how do we get, how do we get around that and, and still get good data? So number one is we don't just look at one antibody response. We want to look at multiple antibody responses. Um, these can work together in a number of ways that the easiest to think about is just each one is a little bit of a noisy measurement and you put a few of them together, you get a less noisy measurement. But the other um, the other thing is that different antibodies might actually tell you different things. So for instance, it might be that some antibodies tell you a lot about your cumulative exposure. And based on what we know about your cumulative exposure, it influences the way to which more recent, uh, um, more short-lived antibodies um, respond in terms of the, the relationship between the time since exposure and the, and the level you measure. And in fact, the extreme might be if you've had so much exposure, there's certain antibodies that you might just throw out because you say, well, if these are so high, then we know that these other ones are just going to be high no matter what. And so, you know, essentially we, we can't use them. And by, by characterizing these relationships between age, exposure, um, and antibodies and using multiple antigens uh, together, we can essentially tease out some of those nuances uh, or at least know where we can't use information for from certain antibodies for certain people. The other thing, and I think this was brought up by um, by David earlier, is that we may want to use subsets of antigens for specific age and exposure settings. So whether or not the actual uh, laboratory assay is split into different assays with different analytes, or you just have one that measures everything, but you only use certain subsets in certain settings, I think is more of a practical question. But essentially, we know that certain... 
um, certain antibody responses are going to be most informative in certain agent exposure settings, and other ones may actually be completely uninformative. So for instance, something highly immunogenic might be useless in an adult from a high transmission area, but might be very useful in a younger person uh, who's been exposed for the first or second time in a low transmission area. Um, finally, we're, we're, we've so far been looking at mostly at the individual level, but um, and in the end, we're going to be averaging over uh, multiple people in a population over time to, to get to get what we want, as opposed to just looking at a single um, person's data. So even if an individual person's data are noisy, again, think, thinking as a comparison, parasite prevalence, that's extremely noisy. It's just you know one or zero. You can't really do anything with that. Whereas if you have some quantitative but somewhat imprecise measurement for a, a person about their time since exposure, you can imagine over tens or dozens of people, that becomes a very precise information uh, amount of information about the population. All right, next slide. So Isabel and I and a number of other um, teams, including from other isomers, are working on trying to build these cameras for global malaria surveillance by really looking at a wide range of cohorts, um, collaborating with several isomers. Uh, this, is, this project is, is dynamic. If, if there are people that are interested, please reach out to us. Um, We're in the process of actually doing the final sample selection for some large screens using different platforms. And uh, even if you're just interested in kind of keeping um, uh, keeping up with what we're doing and kind of informing as, as we get more biomarkers, please let us know. Um, we're doing um, de novo high throughput antibody screens using a number of different technologies, um, the different analytical techniques that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and then the, the next phase uh, after we do this first screen, hopefully in the next few months, is to produce recombinant uh, peptides or proteins and then reevaluate um, ideally using more longitudinal sampling within an individual over time, which is uh, potentially what one of those participants was, was suggesting earlier. Um, when you have a smaller number of analytes, you can look at a larger number of samples more easily. And then finally, trying to build cameras uh, after they're validated in multiple settings where uh, we choose the analytes, um, the measurement platforms, whether that's point of contact or something that's more central lab based, and, and really importantly, uh, finalizing the analytics so we can get the, the epidemiologic metrics that we're interested in. And in the end, there's always going to be a trade-off between the complexity of the assay. Um, for instance, the number of analytes we measure and the precision with which we measure them, whether that's a binary response or a quantitative or semi-quantitative, and the information content. And David brought this up earlier. Um, David, you know, to answer your question, I think uh, it's there's definitely going to be this trade-off. I think that, you know the number of analytes uh, will probably, as we look at a broader range of settings, probably more analytes will be better in part because we're essentially only going to use the information for some of them in certain areas. Um, the exact numbers, I, I don't have a good sense, but I think the thing that we'll be able to measure trade off and then to decide based on the cost of including things uh, and the amount of information and generalizability that we gain, what would be the ideal balance. Next slide. Um, this is another uh, manuscript that should be coming out soon. Again, a collaboration between Chris Drakely, Evo, um, Jennifer uh, Daly, Isabel, and myself, and a number of other people who convened uh, at an in-person meeting specifically on malaria serology. And we looked at five priority use cases. This was um, specifically looking at elimination, but I think a lot of the same use cases are also valuable for the control setting. And they range from, depending on the transmission intensity and the target population, um, you know, what their, what their value is. So stratification of risk, essentially, how much transmission do you have? Uh, in area X versus Y, where do you want to put your interventions? I think is probably uh, the, a salient question across a wide range of transmission intensities uh, at the population level. And then ultimately, you know, an extension of that is documenting the, the end of, of transmission when you've eliminated. Mm -hmm. I think similar to that, but slightly different is kind of measuring changes over time as opposed to geographic space. Uh, and these are these are particularly important to get very recent exposure because if your changes, if your interventions are occurring, say on a yearly basis, you want to know what's happened in the last year, not what's happened before that. Um, two special cases that we also considered where uh, the, uh, uh, an intervention would be immediately applied would be some sort of decentralized immediate response. So you have a team, for instance, that would go to a village and based on the number of people that um, that tested positive or gave a certain score on a portable test, you would do something like IRS or MDA. Um, and for that particular case, you would need a, um, a point of contact test. The other three 
totally fine to have a lab-based assay, which may be more efficient. Um, and then a special case for those with, with hypnozoites, uh, P. vivax, um, in particular, doing serologic test and treat to identify people with the dormant hypnozoites. Brian, we had a question about uh, considering cross-reactivity in malaria serology among different species of parasites. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's definitely a question. And, and one of the things that I didn't list on the slide, but it's definitely uh, an issue is when you're doing these generalizations uh, in different cohorts, you want to make sure that you have cohorts where you've got people with different co-infections so you can evaluate for that. We've actually had a debate within the community as to whether that's an issue or not. Some people argue that, well, hey, if you are exposed to any species of malaria parasite, it shows that you're at risk for, you know, for any of them because the vectors are often the same. Um, but uh, there is certainly also a point to be made that um, antigen specificity, you at least want to know what it's telling you um, and whether they're yeah. specific or not will depend on the particular response. And I think it's also important to note that trying to figure out whether, based on purely informatics, whether or not it's going to be cross-reactive has been challenging at best, and it certainly needs confirmation with empiric data to, to show um, the degree of cross-reactivity with different species. Um, so just finally, to, to, to some outstanding questions that we think are, are, are still important to address. Um, one we talked about for a good part of this talk, which is really what are the most informative antibodies that we want to measure for malaria surveillance in different populations? Um, the second order question is, you know, how do we balance uh, the information that we get out of an assay and its generalizability versus the complexity and the cost of the assay, and ultimately what platforms are we going to use for generating the data? Um, these are still things being worked out. I think a really interesting and probably uh, important growth area in terms of using serology is how do, you know thinking of ways that we can best collect data. So clearly, cross-sectional surveys that are existing, passive case detection. Um, not been used as much, but certainly it's an existing platform. These are definitely uh, available opportunities for, for collecting samples. Um, they both have their pros and cons, uh, but there might also be new opportunities. So for instance, specific sentinel surveillance, whether that's in uh, pregnant women or other at-risk populations uh, or at health facilities, trying to get data uh, in a very efficient manner so that you can not have to spend a lot of money on cross-sectional surveys or at least augment those data with more um, dense geographic and temporal uh, data points. And then finally, you know, once you have all of these uh, pieces of information, really working out appropriate analytical frameworks so you can incorporate not just serology data and think about that, that estimate on its own and compare it to something else, but really incorporating the data you have from health facilities from parasite prevalence, from serology, um, including spatial and temporal dimensions so that you can get the most accurate estimate of what's going on in your community and you can really decide what, most, what interventions are working and what are, the, um, what are the next steps in terms of trying to really drive down malaria. Yeah, and that's, that's our presentation. <laughs> of course, acknowledging a lot of people that are involved and or that have been involved in the work that we're doing to develop these cameras, uh, both at UCSF, at, in London, uh, in Uganda, and the broader network of collaborators that are involved in this project. Okay, thanks, Brian and Isabel. Um, if people have questions, we're, it's at it's, um, 9 a.m. now, Pacific time. Um, but if people want to stay and ask questions, Isabel and Brian, do you have time? Yes. Yeah, I can. I can stay. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if any other questions come through. Yeah, and thanks everybody for um, for for sitting through an hour of, of listening to Isabel and I talk. We we're really excited about this stuff, obviously, and would be really happy to talk to anybody uh, either now or or uh, separately. Uh, and we'll both be yeah. at ASTMH if people want to meet up in person. Next week, just, yeah. yeah. If there are uh, if there are no other questions, let me just uh, uh, thank everyone for staying on during this uh, call. Sheena will follow up with an with an email, uh, touching on a variety of points. Uh, first of all, uh, to to ask if there are any. Further questions, which you're welcome to convey to uh, to um, Isabel and Brian directly, or we can do uh, via the group. Um, secondly, 
to see how this technology has worked for you, to check what the sound quality has been like, whether you were able to uh, uh, hear appropriately, answer, ask any questions that you wanted, uh, what kinds of changes would be helpful for future webinars. And thirdly, to, to uh, suggest some possible topics for additional uh, webinar sessions. Obviously, the, the turnout for this is, has, has, has been strong and is, is uh, uh, much more cost effective to be able to run a worldwide um, webinar online than to send people jetting around the world to meet with each of our individual sites. So thanks very much to, to Sheena and Isabel for, for setting that up. Oh, and this is also going to be, this session has been recorded and we will be posting the session and let you know where to find it in case you have colleagues who want to watch it or you want to rewatch parts of it later. All right. Okay. Thanks very much to everyone. We'll log off until next time and look forward to seeing some of you at ASTMH and the rest of you on the, on the next uh, uh, webinar in a couple of months time.